Hello, this video is going to show how we can perform object code verification using Wind River's Deupdata compiler, Lauterbach Trace32 and the PowerQuick CPU. Now, why do we need to perform object code verification? Well, if we take a look at the DO178C standard, section 6.4.4.2 talks about structural coverage analysis. And of course, it's necessary to ensure that we've measured 100% statement coverage, branch decision coverage, and also MCDC on the, the source code. But at the end of the day, there is no source code flying in the plane. This gets converted by the compiler into object code. And so for DAO level A, we want to ensure that the compiler and linker has not actually added any additional code that can't be traced back to source code statements. So how can we do that? Well, let's take a look. Now, the starting point here is I have some source code, some reasonably simple C source code, and I'm going to check I can build this first of all. So I have a make file, and as we can see, I'm using the Diab data compiler, and I'm targeting a PowerPC 8548. So let's check we can actually build this. So let's go and perform the build. And there we can see that has now successfully built our executable. Right, so I now want to start testing this code. So what I've done is I've used LDRay's tbrun and I've created a number of test cases for the function we just looked at. And if we look at each individual function, what we're going to see is we have a number of inputs. Well, these inputs are globals, so I could assign them to, to a value like I've done here, or I could retain them as the initial value. And here I've got some inputs, and these are the expected outputs. So let's go and execute this. So this is now going to generate a program. It's built it using the Diab data compiler, and it's just run it, in this particular case, using the Lauterbach Trace32 simulator. And as we can see, all these tests have passed. What does that mean? Well, that means with these inputs, we got the outputs that we're expecting here. So that's good. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to suspend one of these tests and then I won't get 100% coverage. So I'm just going to go and suspend this particular test. Right, and let's just run it again, check it all, all works. So in this particular case, instead of running all seven tests, all eight, I'm just running seven of them. Now, what I want to do is to find out, well, as I execute my tests, what coverage have I obtained? So to do that, instead of using the original source code, I'm going to use the instrumented version of the source code. So once again, let's run these tests. So it needs to do a little bit more analysis. Then it's going to generate the program, build it using the Diab data compiler, executing it on the Trace32 simulator, and we can see the tests have passed. Well, once again, that means that with the imports that we specified, we're getting exactly the same outputs as we did before. So since the tests have passed, we can now take a look at the coverage. And if we expand the integer to ASCII here, we can see we haven't got 100% coverage. Well, that's because I've suspended one test. But let's take a look and see what coverage we obtained for this function integer to ASCII. So in this particular case, I'm opening a flow graph and we can see very clearly that we have not executed this block of code here. Right, that's good. So let's now go and take a look at the object code. Well, we can't do much with the object code, but what we can do is we can ask the compiler to generate the assembler code, and then we can measure the coverage on the assembler code. So let's put this into a mode that we're calling here Redbox. And now let's execute these tests again. But this time it's actually asked the compiler to generate the assembler code, and then we've instrumented the assembler code. Once again, the tests have passed, so that means that our instrumentation has not affected the code. And so now we can take a look at the coverage of our assembler code. So let's take a look at that coverage analysis report. And as we can see, it's failed. This time we're looking at the assembler code for this function or this file integer to ASCII. And if we scroll down, we can see here that we have 91% statement coverage, 95% branch coverage. So here we can see every line of assembler code and highlighted here we've not executed all 
these lines of code. So now let's go and unsuspend our test case. So let's go and unsuspend this and let's run the test cases again in white box mode and check we're getting 100% coverage. So once again, that's now executed the test cases and we should find that these all pass again. And now we should find that the statement coverage, branch decision coverage and MCDC is now 100%. So let's run and now on the assembler code and see if we get 100% coverage of the assembler code. So once again, I'm just going to run this. Again, it's generated the assembler code, it's instrumented it, it's built it, all our tests have passed. And so now we're going to be able to take a look at the underlining assembler coverage. And in this particular case, we can see it's passed. So that means that this compiler in this particular case, with the options I've got set, has not generated any additional code that can't be traced back to a statement in the source code. So there we can see previously, we hadn't got coverage for these lines of code. Now we have got coverage. And similarly, we should be able to take a look at the branches. And once again, there was a branch that wasn't executed in the first run. Now that is executed. So we've got 100% branch decision coverage. OK, so hopefully that's given you a quick introduction as to how we can perform object code verification. And if you'd like more information, then please don't hesitate to contact us at LDRA. Thank you.